How bad is fat? It's good. I mean, I've been it's the best bit on the steak to me. You know what I mean? I, I, I like a bit of fat, but, um, it, well, scientists say it's bad for you. And, you know, you eat, I mean, if I did a test and ate it for a week, I could probably tell you the answer. Um, but, you know, I, I haven't, so... But I, all I know that people say it's bad, so it's bad. Well, it's bad for the arteries, bad for your heart. Saturated fat, that is, anyway. That's about all I know. <laughs> I would look at the fat content. content. They say less than six grams, so I'll probably look at that. And calories, I would look at. All the rest of the stuff, I wouldn't take any notice on. I think it's become too complicated. So when you stop people in the street and ask them about healthy eating, they'll tell you categorically that fat is bad. And yet if you ask them for evidence, they'd be completely stumped. Because the fact is that the study to investigate fat, saturated fat and heart disease has not been done and the authorities admit it probably never will be done. Throughout history, we have always understood that starchy foods are fattening and sugary stuff even more so. And yet we did a U-turn in our dietary advice to say base your meals on starchy foods. Why did we do this? Well, it was on the back of one study, a study called the Seven Countries Study that was published in 1970. An American doctor named Ansel Keys wanted to investigate a possible relationship between dietary fat, cholesterol and heart disease. And he found a relationship of sorts, but in seven hand-picked countries. Now, there were many more countries at the time, and there are now, that disproved the theory, and yet these were completely ignored. The consequences of this U-turn have been catastrophic. In 1972, just 2.7% of men and women were obese. Roll forward to the end of the last century, 22.6% of men, 25.8% of women were obese. Now, during that time, when obesity increased nearly tenfold in barely 25 to 30 years, our consumption of meat and eggs and butter and whole milk plummeted and our consumption of cereals, cereal products, fruits and whole grains increased dramatically. So it's not fat that's made us fat but the foods that we have replaced it with. The UK, UK PLC, has done an experiment, an experiment that should never have been done and should not be repeated. We have proven that fat and real food does not make us fat but processed carbohydrates do and we will pay the consequences for years to come. I need to be happy with the way that I'm farming and I feel that organic farming and farming at a grass-based system is a system which I feel happiest with. The pressures aren't on the animals too much, we're not pushing the animals to the extreme in terms of production, so I believe that gives a better product at the end of the day. I think a traditional diet is, is sensible people rely a lot less on processed foods. And I think a lot of the health problems we see nowadays, uh, not just obesity, but a number of other health-related problems are because of over-processing in food. The reason this farming system is so important to me is that ultimately agriculture in the future needs to be sustainable and I feel that the system that I've adopted does look to, to find a solution to so many of these problems, certainly around the production of livestock and, and the beautiful simplicity of the system and the way that it works with nature to get the most out of the animals, the most out of the grass, the most out of the soil is what really excites me. Just the fact that kind of nature has an answer to all of these problems, nature has a solution and if only you know what nature's response is, you can harness that to your benefit. I care about farming because I think we need to look out to our countryside and I think we need to look out to our animals. I like to know how the milk's produced and how it's kept and, and I like the milk from healthy cows. And to me, having the countryside, the soil, the grazing, and the cows out is all part of that story. You start off with healthy cows and healthy pastures and then you'll have healthy products from those cows. And that's where it's very important to me, to be able to sell a product 
than I believe in. From these Guernsey cows, we produce the unpasteurised, untreated Guernsey milk and unpasteurised, untreated Guernsey cream. And from the milk, we also produce yoghurt on the farm. We've got plain yoghurt, fruited yoghurt, creme fraiche, sour cream. Guernsey cows are the only breed that doesn't digest the beta-carotene in the grass. And the beta-carotene is what gives the milk the nice, rich yellow colour. The milk differs. One, it's unpasteurised. Two, it's from Guernsey cows. And three, it's, it's from a grazing system. And you'll find that the milk is a whole different experience. There's more body, there's more flavour. And once people taste this milk, you very rarely find they say it's, they don't like it or they'll go back to what they were using before. It's the grass, I'm sure, and the cows that give this this unique taste. Unpasteurised milk is very safe. Uh, if you go back years and years and years and years, you'll find that there's not been one case of food poison from unpasteurised milk. And unpasteurised milk is safe because we have to make sure it's safe. We can't willy-nilly just milk our cows. The food production process starts from when the cows come in the parlour. We have to ensure that those teats and others are clean before we put the cluster on. And then, when, the, when we put the cluster on, it goes from there into the bulk tank. And we say it's from teat to tank within a, and cooled down uh, within 10 minutes. Unpasteurised um, milk's got more body, um, more enzymes, more flavour, good bacteria. It's, it's a bit like, this is it's a free way of, of buying your Jacobs because the Jacobs have got all the good bacteria in, well, so is unpasteurised milk. So oh, instead of buying all that stuff, you need to just buy some lovely unpasteurised milk. We're a pasture farm consisting of 22 acres. It was originally farmed by my grandfather and father as a dairy farm. It was a, a much larger acreage at the time, but they sold the cows and a lot of the acres back in the 1980s when they felt that struggling to make a profit out of the milk industry at the time, and they felt that it was the right time to sell for them. The land has then been rented out to other neighbours for the last 10 or 15 years and then recently I grabbed the opportunity to, to take it on myself and do something for myself with what remained. The, we currently stock the farm with, with geese for Christmas, uh, native breed cattle and pole dorset sheep. We've been farming here for a few generations now, I think I'm the fourth generation uh, on the farm here. It was a conventional mixed farm years and years ago. Um, in my father's time it it changed over to become more intensive and we were intensive beef and sheep farm but we now farm a mixed farming system with keeping some pigs and some poultry as well a grass-based system and a lot of things are similar to what my father farmed when he was younger in the use of different herbs and mixtures in the in the pastures and things like that but it's a system that we're very happy with oh that's brilliant thanks for that yeah lovely job thanks then Whatever we do, we have to maximise as much as we can from, from what we've got. So selling through a third party um, isn't the best way for us. We really need to, to maximise our profits. So we try to sell direct as much as possible. OK. Could I have, please, a dozen of those Tuscans? So sure. we took the plunge and decided to have a farm shop. It's quite an unusual place to have a farm shop because we're not directly on a main road. We're not in the middle of a town, but we are on the farm. So we take the attitude that people can come to the farm. We run an open farm, um, so people can wander around at any time, and they do. Do you want the fillet cut up, or do you want it left whole? We produce all of our own meat, so we know exactly where it's come from, we know how it's been That's reared, we know how it's been slaughtered, and then it's cut up here. And then we do all the processing here, so we make our own sausages, we make our own bacon, dry cured bacon. So we know we own the whole process. We can see it all the way through. The meat and dairy that we've just seen is not only ethical and more enjoyable, it's the only way to eat. We seem to have forgotten why we eat. We eat because we need essential fats, complete proteins, vitamins and minerals. And the best sources of these foods are animal foods. Liver is the single most nutritious food on the planet. It even has four times the vitamin C of an apple. Not many people know that. 
animal foods generally are the best sources of the nutrients that humans need and in many cases they are the only sources. Retinol, B12, D3, K2 and heme iron are only found in animal foods. So the healthy whole grains that we're told to favour simply cannot compete with Dave's milk, Rob and Ollie's cattle and the eggs sold in Lizzie's farm shop. Ruminants have to live and graze on pasture land. They have to get the nutrients from the soil and they then give back to the soil. Ruminants, we know them as sheep, cows and goats, are host to billions of microorganisms. They eat, host and then excrete those microorganisms and in so doing they rejuvenate the topsoil. Topsoil that was once feet deep is now barely millimetres thick in certain parts of the planet. And as we've rolled back the pasture lands to make way for soya and grains, so we've destroyed the health of the planet as fast as we're destroying human health. Our aim is to keep the cows out for as long as possible grazing the grass. And we've got tracks all the way through our farms now, so we can either strip graze or paddock graze, just one paddock here today and then tomorrow the next paddock and the day after the next paddock until we go right the way around the farm. You get less milk, which is a disadvantage, but you've got not, you haven't got the costs. You, you've, they're going out and finding their own food, they're leaving their deposits outside rather than in the shed where you have to clean all that up and clean it out and that's another cost, um, spreading that over the countryside. And, and it's benefit to the cows as well, they're healthier, the coat shine and, and the whole well-being of the whole animal is another benefit to it. We would use some concentrate but the 95% of the diet is grass or grass silage and that's what we aim to do. They have to work for their food rather than us, us bring their food to them. And also, you, instead of using fertilisers or lots of fertilisers, you're putting the organic matter back on as the cow grazes. So that's a, a, another big um, ad advantage. Conventional systems, farming systems, um, are, are as a rule of thumb quite intensive and they are using um, tractors and fertilisers, pesticides and fungicides, all of which um, rely on, on oil in various forms um, to, make, you know, to make those things and, and that is ultimately unsustainable. You know, oil is finite. And so agriculture and, and agriculture going into the future needs to find a way to be less reliable on those oil resources. And this is the nice thing about the system I've adopted is that I can rear all, all these animals on on a very healthy system without the need of using any fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, um, without using any fertilizers and without really needing any mechanized equipment. That's it, if we keep walking slowly, keep them calm. We aim to keep things simple to be to be quite honest. Um, we, we produce uh, as much of our own food as possible from the farm. So uh, the sheep and the cattle are on uh, grass diets all the way through. We, um, the pigs, it's amazing how much grass pigs will actually eat. So they're, they're sort of grazed around, around the farm. They do churn it up a lot in the winter, but um, in the summer, it's and most of the year, it's surprising what they'll graze. And likewise with the chickens. It's interesting how much chickens will spend actually out grazing and obviously the carotene from the grass is, is brilliant for the egg yolks and for the quality of the eggs. We're not forcing any animals at all, everything uh, grows to its normal growth rate. We tend to use breeds of animals, native and local breeds to the southwest actually, that uh, will grow well off of grass. The U-turn in our dietary advice from starchy foods of fattening to base your meals on starchy foods has been the single biggest driver of the fake food industry. As we shun bacon and eggs for breakfast, we have sugary cereal and starchy toast instead. And instead of having delicious and nutritious red meat for supper, we have pasta or pizza. PepsiCo makes $66.5 billion a year. That's more than the GDP of 68% of the countries in the world. That's how much is at stake. That's how much is invested in making sure that those people in the street think that fat is bad. So do you want to be part of making PepsiCo bigger than Syria? 
Or do you want to support the ethics and the efforts of producers such as Lizzie, Rob, Ollie and Dave? Let's help the Davids of this world take on these Goliaths for your health, for the animals' health and for the health of the planet. Hi Jerry, nice to see you. Ah, Here's the box. Thank and you very much. How do you get on with the last lot? Oh great, There's, it's nearly all gone, we've got one joint left. Okay. So, uh... I try and sell the majority of my meat direct to the customer. But the main tool for the selling of the meat is, is through my website. Um, I found this to be the most powerful and cost-effective way to market. It gives me the opportunity to reach a, a national audience. The information is always available to the customer. People who are looking to buy meat direct from, from the farm like to know the story behind the meat. So they don't like to make their purchases without knowing more about the person they're buying from. So a website is a good way for me to be very transparent and for me to be able to tell everyone about what I'm doing. And because it's something that I can update very easily, um, I'm also always able to put new information up there to keep encouraging people to return. We've got an honesty box here at the farm and people can come down the drive and leave the money, hopefully, and take the products. Or else we do some farmers markets. We do three London ones, which is Marlebone, Islington and Notting Hill. So which we go up, well, Notting Hill's weekly and, and the other two are fortnightly. Well, I have, to, I have a, a week's supply frozen. Just to, for emergency. You're, you're not here next week? No. Are you here the week after? Yes. Fantastic. We've got customers that turn up with suitcases and, and then fill up their suitcase with 20 carts of milk. It's just like they're off to the train station. So it's, it's brilliant. It's well received. There's more and more people wanting and demanding unpasteurised milk. Morning, David. Four, please, Dave. They want to go back to how it used to be, where it's unadulterated. Yeah, here you are. Oh, oh my there. God. And it's natural and, and from the cow. If I go to market on a Saturday, well, the milk will be Friday's milk, so that's only a day old. But if you get to the supermarket, then that's going to be at least four days old by the time they actually have it on the shelves. So, uh, let alone when they get it home and use it. So, oh yeah, the freshness is far, far superior, far fresher than the supermarket milk would be. What's on? Well done. A bit farther. Get your head up. And we have people come down from the Go from on, London no. to visit the farm, well so that they can well actually done. see how clean it is well and how it's produced and how well the cows look and the grasses that they graze. So that that's really lovely. You had a good half term. Yes, but it's never long enough. There's a call from the village. Then we have, I guess, from a sort of 10, 15 mile radius customers. We do have a few people that will come down to stay with friends that have come from London, maybe, and they come down and fill up their freezers or on the way back from holiday and they come in and that's great. That might be every six months that they particularly do that. It shows that they're having yeah, difficulty sourcing <laughs> food of this sort of quality. We've lost touch with food and what is food and an awful lot of what people are eating now is just not what I would count as food, or not what people 50 years ago would look at and think was food either. And I think the supermarkets have a huge part in this. They say it's only what people want, but it's not what people want unless it's put out there and put on a two-for-one offer. And just the amount of food that's being consumed is quite terrifying in itself. And then the amount of food which has very, very little nutritional content that's being consumed is very scary. So I think a huge amount of education needs to be done. I love what Lizzie just said. We've lost touch with food, what it is and what we need to eat. Well, we need to eat real food and not processed food. Animals need to graze on pasture land. We then need to eat them and their products to gain the nutrients that humans need for optimal health. And they need to be on that pasture land to give back to the soil, to protect the future of our planet. The idea that the foods that we've been eating since time began, the animals, the red meat, are in any way responsible for a modern illness, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, is quite frankly absurd.
if we've been eating the real food that the planet provides for 24 hours, then agriculture gave us large-scale access to carbohydrates just four minutes ago. And in the past five seconds, our consumption of sugar has gone up 20-fold. I wonder which food is more likely responsible for any modern illness and the obesity epidemic. When you skim milk and you start to drink your skim and you're semi-skimmed, out with the cream has gone your fat-soluble vitamins. So you think you've bought something and you're not using it. You've, it's, the dairies have got that bit. Also then, the essential, so there's a lot of essential amino acids you're not getting. And the calcium that is left in your skim and semi-skim milk, you can't absorb properly without the fat. So your milk is greater than the sum of its parts. Together, it's a truly wholesome, nutritional food. And all the latest research is saying that. Drink your whole milk and get the full benefits from milk.